Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our briefing this afternoon. My name is Carol Werner, and I am the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And on behalf of EESI and our partners, the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, we are so glad that you are here with us this afternoon for this, uh, what we think is both a very important and a very exciting topic on how businesses, cities, and states are leading climate action efforts. Just a month ago, there was a, a very, very large global climate change summit held in San Francisco that was hosted by Governor Jerry Brown, uh, by uh, Michael Bloomberg, who is now the UN Special Envoy for Climate Action, and it also included China's Special Representative for Climate Change Affairs. And the, the summit attracted more than 4,500 representatives to that, but there were also hundreds of side events across San Francisco, which spoke to both the energy, the concern, the innovation, the inspiration that we are seeing coming from people at all levels of the private sector, the public sector, whether it is mayors, city council people, governors, as well as their, their counterparts in other countries around the world, because this was indeed an international conference. We thought that it was so important that we wanted to hold a briefing here so that for many of us who were not able to be there, we would have a chance to hear from a variety of voices about what happened there, why people were committed, the kinds of commitments that were happening there, and why it is important. So to kick off our discussion this afternoon, we're going to first hear from Dan Carroll who is the Senior Advisor for Infrastructure and Energy for the Office of California Governor Jerry Brown. And we wanted Dan to be here this afternoon to talk a little bit about kind of an overview about, about the conference, what it was, why it was important, what, they, what the, the governor's office saw coming out of this, and the kinds of work that they did with so many people, both in the United States and across the globe in terms of this whole summit happening and now looking at steps coming out of that. Dan brings a lot of experience and particularly he focuses in Calif uh, with regard to California on accelerating innovative climate finance projects and partnerships inside California regionally as well as nationally. He also directs the state's interagency opportunity zones workforce or work group and he serves on the executive committee of the U.S. Climate Alliance, which is a 16-state bipartisan alliance of states moving forward to implement the, the goals of the Paris Agreement. He brings experience also in the private sector, and I think one of the things that is also important is that it just shows that he is an entrepreneur and is an innovative uh, uh, spirit at heart, and that he is in a, a very uh, exciting place uh, at a time when there is so much work going forward on this whole issue. And of course, all of this makes perfect sense in terms of thinking about how people are being brought together and that EESI was formed uh, over 35 years ago by bipartisan congressional caucus for the purpose of talking about key issues, trying to bring people together and find workable solutions. So with that, Dan. Let's get set up here. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. So I see a clock back there, so I'll try to keep my time, but give me a two-minute warning if I'm blathering too long, all right? Um, so let's see. I wanted to – so this is going to work. Voila. Okay. Um, so first of all, I was asked to give kind of a readout on uh, what happened at the summit and sort of a look ahead uh, from our perspective, uh, California, on how – the business local state alliance can keep working together. So I think it would first help to talk a little bit about why we did the summit and basically uh, three reasons for that. Uh, first, frankly, the reality of the Paris Agreement. Um, as many of you know, whether we're in the agreement or out of the agreement, the implementation of it is all about bottom-up implementation to make our numbers by localities, cities, states, communities, business leaders, civic entrepreneurs, you, you name it. So 
if there's any silver lining in where the national government and the Trump administration is in pulling out of Paris, uh, I would point out to you that at some level it removes every excuse for why we shouldn't expect Washington DC to fix everything and everyone needs to, wherever they're standing, sitting, working to, to get busy. So that was number one as to why we had the summit. Um, the second reason we had is frankly, we're going too slow in making our numbers, however you wanna measure them in terms of carbon cuts. Um, I am one of the co was one of the co-leads of the climate finance bucket, so it's good. It's a somewhat a business-oriented group, so we tend to focus a little bit more on the climate finance side. But you know, Christiana Figueres has pointed out that we're basically investing about 250 billion dollars every year in uh, climate-oriented, low-carbon projects. Wonderful, impressive, but we really need to be doing about a trillion dollars a year. To, to make our numbers on the carbon side. So we needed to go faster and having, while we've joked among ourselves and the organizers, would we ever want or a, another subnational want to take on something like this again? There's no one like volunteering right now, but this, this given the moment, um, it was very important to have the event, um, which brings me to the, th the third reason we had, it was really to sort of make clear that the, we are still in movement broadly defined is in fact um, rallying together, having, you know, as uh, was pointed out, we had about 4,500 delegates there, many of them international. So it was an opportunity to bring local implementers and innovators from across the globe, but also to make clear that there are people in the United States that are still very much in the game and very committed to accelerating climate action. Um, so how did we do? Um, you know, I've shared with, with BASE and ESI the full roster of commit, commitments and announcements. It's also still available up on the website. Um, happy to work with you to, to get them out to people, but I just wanted to highlight uh, a chunk of them. Um, the ESPN stats, 4,500 people, more than 350 affiliate events. It was uh, painful to miss out. There were some amazing side events, affiliate events that were going on through the week and work and commitments that happened there that you know we're still tracking down what happened and, and excited about some of the stuff that, that happened off stage on the main stage. Um, I think we certainly checked the box for international leaders that there really is a we are still in movement. It's not a one day wonder, um, but it's the real deal. Take just one example, the U.S. Climate Alliance I'm very involved in. You know, this is 40% of the U.S. population. Uh, we released our first annual report. So when the day when Paris happened and all these announcements were made, you roll the clock ahead at that point, I guess it was about 15 months. You know, we actually got serious technical assistance, sharing of best practices, additional states joining. We had a major dialogue with North American leaders from Canada and Mexico. There's a major announcement on short-lived climate pollutants. So again, the, the focus of this, and not just with the US Climate Alliance, is there's nerdy, serious work going on to implement as opposed to this is just a press thing that happened and will happen again. On the investor side, um, I, I see Ann Kelly from Series. Series pulled together uh, 400 investors representing about $12 trillion in assets for a meeting announced a new investor agenda. Again, you can check their website for there. I was, um, was, was thrilled to be at that meeting. There were announcements made around doing an additional trillion dollars in green bonds um, and asked me if, what a green bond is after if, if you'd like, like to do more. Uh, we also uh, released a climate finance playbook uh, during this major Friday finance roundup that we had at the end of this summit, kind of indicating there's been a problem where different types of investors looking for different types of projects and different types of geographies are talking past each other. So we work with the UN PRI and others to put together kind of a simple playbook to help people find each other and to make those conversations move more quickly. Um, ACOR announced a trillion dollars in renewable investment by 2030. Uh, the European Investment Bank, not to be outdone, announced 1.4 trillion dollars in uh, by 2030 in renewable commitments. That's with the euro. It's a trillion and a trillion, but it actually is 1.4 uh, trillion dollars. Uh, 60 to subnationals committed to 100% zero emission by 2050. 
California by 2045, just, you know, hey, why not? Um, net zero building commitments at the meeting were made equivalent to 50 coal-fired power plants. Um, so in general, um, you know, I think we built up a lot of good momentum heading into COP24 and the UN Secretary General's 2019 meetings on the climate finance side. We put up in our playbook a little cute cartoon to kind of give a sense of where the climate finance tribe is, is heading over time up, up various mountains and challenges. Um, I think most significantly, though, I think what we did there was drive what we called a high ambition model where we tried to create sort of ping pong between geographies. So an example, uh, last year, Governor Brown signed a landmark buy clean bill. About 20% of our emissions are actually embedded in the products that we buy from China and other places. Uh, as a result of that, it led to some major activity from the Europeans around buy clean. It was a very exciting side event. The EIB trillion dollar matching ACOR was another example of high ambition. So the, the friendly competition of Europe's doing well here or India's doing well here or China doing well there, I think was, was really, in terms of the program design, we really wanted to make sure somebody was on stage, they were responding with high ambition. And uh, in some cases, it really is true that, you know, how locals and states can learn together is, is really critical. And last but not least, uh, you may have heard in, in California that we decided, it, in the words of Governor Jerry Brown, to launch our own dam satellite. Um, it's actually a network of small satellites. There's new technology that will allow us to do methane detection and, in this case, mitigation to be able to identify where leaks are happening uh, on a global basis. Um, we believe there's a, potentially $10 billion in economic savings from methane detection. Um, California, through our uh, Air Resources Board, will also be the, the way the deal works with the company Planet that we're doing it with. They'll launch the satellites, we'll get free methane data, and then build a data consortium with other nonprofits, countries, and potentially even with oil companies who would have an interest in knowing where they're leaking product at the same time as we encourage them to find another business model. Um, anyhow, it's pretty cool and smart stuff. If you're interested in more, there's a great article in the LA Times by George Skelton to, to check that out. In terms of looking ahead, um, and happy to take questions on that, but I wanted to highlight uh, a few things. First of all, you know, obviously a big fingers crossed on the 2018 election and the 2020 election that we can elect more climate leaders and fewer deniers as we move forward, but I did want to point out as Al Gore was on fire uh, during the summit, and I think as his 17 appearances, um, he pointed out uh, way more definitely than I'm about to that the next president in 2020, should they cho choose to do, do so, will have 30 days from their inauguration to get back into Paris. And so while we're out, we're not really out yet, and so it really underscores, I think, how we can continue the urgency and action to implement from the bottom up in the interim period. Um, and I think that remember, continues to be really the, the, the big game. Um, on sort of the strategic frame, let me make a couple points that may be a little bit controversial about, I think, how we're viewing action forward. So we had the recent IPCC report, which for those of you who are urgent on this issue, it probably made you more urgent on this issue, particularly those of us that have children. Um, and I think the question becomes how we can act with both urgency and steely-eyed uh, discipline to actually make the numbers and believe in the model that we're doing and the great work of the panelists that you're gonna hear from, that both the business model and the political change model, I think, has to be one driven by outcomes. You know, the, it, there's a failure to getting excited, oh, are we gonna rush forward and pass a cap and trade law in 2021? Well, you know, we saw what happened in 2009. We got fingers crossed that the, a uh, moonshot clean energy initiative will pass in California, excuse me, in Washington, which is a blue state. And I think it's very important that, and it's a terrible analogy, but if you think of the North Vietnamese in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, digging tunnels and, and sticking to a strategy that they believe was the winning strategy. I don't know exactly. Uh, first of all, I would welcome a new analogy. Um, but in terms of what's the best way to think about that, I've got a, a, a different uh, 
example, which is, you know, call this the outcomes curve. I think we've all seen the stock market hockey stick curve when things take off. But if you think in terms of outcomes, uh, the business writer Charles Handy talks about the zone of paradox when old business models are giving way to new business models. And we're obviously in a time now where whether it's a carbon to a decarbonized economy, particularly in the US, broken politics, it's very hard to stay disciplined that bottom-up implementation, new business, and community partnerships working at the local and state level where really much of the action is at the PUC level, et cetera, to stick to your guns and know that it's gonna hockey stick over time when in, we have 12 years or we're screwed kind of mentality is out there and understandably so. So I just, you know, at some level, if you believe in what we're doing and if you believe in the momentum that will grow over time in doing it, I would urge you to do that. Um, with that strategic caution in mind, let me just highlight quickly a few areas where businesses, states, and local leaders can drive further momentum moving forward. Um, one, I think, is the economic frame, the competitiveness frame, the business voice, which many of you are leading on in this room. Um, it's not always successful. It's easy in California to talk about climate and talk about climate morality and all that kind of stuff for, for the places that we need to move from 40% to 60% of the U.S. population. Um, that business frame is incredibly important. Um, I can share with, with the group and to sign ups, there was a bicameral letter that was done by members of the House and Senate in support of the summit that I think was just in fantastically uh, well-written messaging about why this is important and, and why we need to continue. Um, however, the election turns out, and uh, the other thing I would point out quickly is in this Congress, if you're familiar with 45Q, $50 a ton for carbon removal, if you're familiar with how additional research dollars were passed for energy and R&D, there's a quiet coalition in Congress, including Republicans that are working to, on an outcomes basis as opposed to a rhetoric basis to get some stuff done. And I think what happened in 2018, I think is instructive to some of the opportunities we have moving forward. What are those? So one, I think RPS increases is a no brainer, stable policy works, RPS is work. And I think we're gonna see more of that happen. Carbon reduction, for those of you, there's a new you know, a, a number of groups, EDF, WRI, and others are basically looking at the problem by 2100, you know, we're gonna have to take 15% of carbon out of the atmosphere or we're also screwed. And there are new technologies, direct air capture, et cetera, that can benefit from 45Q. And I think looking at how we're gonna tackle that beyond just tree planting and working lands work is a, is a critical opportunity. I think the politics on a bipartisan basis are really key. Um, U.S. Climate Alliance is putting together uh, a bunch of materials and playbooks for the new governors that we're going to have. So we're going to have a ton of new governors after this election, blue states, purple states, red states. We're very interested in bringing to them the technical assistance and value proposition of the U.S. Climate Alliance. But for those of you that, you know, the next governor of Missouri or wherever or somewhere that you guys have particular connection would definitely like to work with you to put in the hands of policy directors various playbooks and help for them to get on the ground moving quickly in the way that we helped New Jersey when uh, the new governor came in last year. Uh, was talking with Laura earlier around resilience. Um, resilience and adaptation has not always been a popular to topic among mitigation folk, but the reality is the uh, effects are upon us. More importantly, if we don't get resilience right, we'll have less money to spend on mitigation and there's a clear playbook around pre-disaster uh, mitigation. Um, there are some interesting ideas around innovative federalism and energy race to the top that I think we can pass to support additional resilience work. And I like to tell a story of the, you know, the BP headquarters in Houston was a platinum lead building, but their power source was in the basement and it, they couldn't open it for two months. So we got to blend mitigation and lead and resilience together. Uh, fourth area I think is really important is procurement, both on the government side, on the private sector side. We buy the low cost capital bid. We don't really look at how we maintain assets meant to 30 and 40 years. So both on the private and public side, there's a playbook of activities I think are really super important. 
Um, and on the private side, the Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance is about to roll out, which I think will bring together a lot of businesses and power buyers to really bring additional work forward. So that's the roundup. There will be lots more around naming and shaming and leadership on the business side. So thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Dan, for that whole roundup. And as he said, you know, afterwards, you know, please do feel free to uh, ask him lots of questions or get those questions to us so that we can make sure to get them answered. And as Dan also indicated, there is so much hard work ahead that does have to be the uh, the, the nerdy kinds of stuff and involving people of all kinds at all levels in the private sector in different levels of government uh, across the globe. And for there to be a certain amount of healthy competition in terms of thinking about innovation to really make things better for everybody is going to be terribly important. So it's exciting, but it's also, as you said, urgent and um, uh, and demanding of, of what's really needed. And somebody who is dealing with this very firsthand in terms of his own country uh, and in the role that he is playing as an international leader is our next uh, speaker, and that is Ambassador Solomara. And we are very privileged that he is able to join us today. He is Fiji's ambassador to the United States and to Mexico, as well as High Commissioner to Canada. You should be handling our NAFTA. <laughs> uh, prior to his uh, current appointments, he was Fiji's High Commissioner to the Court of St. James in the UK, where he also served as ambassador to Denmark, Germany, the Holy See, Ireland, and also Israel. So talking about somebody who has had to balance all sorts of portfolios as a diplomat, and, and he has done much more there as uh, diplomatically as well as serving in uh, very senior positions in the Fiji government. And I think one of the things that is also extremely important in terms of coming from Fiji and looking at the situations that confront that important island nation uh, he sees firsthand in terms of the threat of climate and also the, the importance of how we address things because of what it means to people, to cultures, to history, everywhere. And Ambassador uh, Solomaro has been uh, the co-chair with Germany in terms of past, uh, the past conference of parties for the Paris Climate Agreement and, and therefore was able to bring forward a new kind of partnership and relationship in terms of the dialogue, uh, kind of unique to a, uh, a Fiji approach. And so we are privileged, Mr. Ambassador, to have you with us. Uh, thank you very much, Carol, for that uh, introduction, and Dan for your uh, summary of the the summit and what it intends to do. Uh, my role today is to offer a brief overview of uh, how the uh, a small island developing states like Fiji and its participation at the summit uh, view the engagement and uh, what we consider to be a very successful. Uh, partnership that was developed uh, with the private sector, uh, state governments, and uh, non-government agencies, and all these activists together uh, helped us in in highlighting the importance of uh, of working together to resolve uh, uh, this issue that is confronting us. And I think one of the, the important messages that Fiji is carrying along in its COP23 presidency is that government alone cannot deal with uh, uh, this issue. But first, I wish to uh, briefly highlight uh, the IPCC report that came out uh, this uh, last Monday, because it uh, paints a far more calamitous picture of the immediate consequences of climate change than previously thought. And the report says that avoiding the damage requires transforming the world economy at a speed and scale 
that, and I quote, uh, no documented historic uh, precedent, unquote. The report describes a world of worsening food shortages and wildfires and mass die-off of coral reefs as soon as 2040, a period well within the lifetime of much of the global population. The authors also found that if greenhouse gas emissions continue at the current rate, the atmosphere will warm up by as much as 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit or 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels by 2040, inundating coastlines and intensifying droughts and poverty. Previous work had focused on estimating the damage if average temperatures were to rise by a larger number, uh, 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 2 degrees Celsius because that was the threshold scientists previously considered for the most severe effects of climate change. This re new report, however, shows that many of those effects will come much sooner at the 2.7 de Fahrenheit degree mark. And avoiding the most serious damage requires transforming the world economy within just a few years. And it is estimated that the that the cost would come around to some uh, $50 trillion and more. But while they conclude that it is technically possible to achieve the rapid changes required to avoid the 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit or 1.5 degrees Celsius warming, they concede that it may be politically unlikely. I fear that far too many still underestimate the peril we are in due to global warming. We underestimate in part because it's too uncomfortable or politically inconvenient to acknowledge the nature and the scale of the risk. However, recent weather events here in the United States, in Asia and elsewhere should leave no one in doubt. We have entered a frightening new era. And this is at just one degree of warming above the pre-industrial age. Our existing NDCs, or nationally determined contribution, have us on a path to warming of at least three degrees by the end of the century. This, according to the IPCC report, spells catastrophe. Not just for island countries like Fiji, which are currently on the front lines, but all of us. While it seems we must wait for more of the world to wake up to this simple fact, we certainly cannot afford to wait to take action at home. That is why in the last few years, Fiji and other small island developing states, with the help of forward-looking partners, have launched a number of groundbreaking initiatives to stand up to this threat and build the resilience of our infrastructure, communities, and natural environment. For example, we have partnered with the World Bank to conduct the first climate vulnerability assessment of its kind, which is now helping us plan how to move forward in a smart, deliberate fashion. Last year, we, did, we launched the first sovereign green bond for a developing country to fund both mitigation and adaptation projects. And earlier this year, we listed it on the London Stock Exchange. We are taking a leading role in exploring ways to expand renewable energy to isolated communities. We are also developing insurance products tailor-made for small islands and vulnerable countries. And we are beginning to consider some of the legal complexities that will arise as more and more people are dis displaced or made homeless by climate change. But as we take action at the national level, Fiji is also proud to do what we can to lead at the global level. As you know, this is the year of the Talanoa Dialogue in the Fiji's COP presidency, which is based on the concept of an open, honest, and respectful process of dialogue used in communities in Fiji and other Pacific Island countries. The idea of Talanoa is to move the world beyond debates and zero-sum negotiations in order to bring the best ideas to the surface and share them. All in, all in an effort to give political leaders 
the inspiration, the tools, and the partnership they need to prepare for more ambitious emission reduction targets by 2020. One of the greatest examples of the power of the Stalanoa Dialogue was the Global Climate Action Summit hosted by Governor Jerry Brown last month. Investors, cities, states, civil society groups, and others showed us the groundswell of climate action that is taking place around the world. They showed us how some of the brightest minds have turned their attention to developing the technology and solutions to help us face this crisis. And most importantly, they showed us a number of ways that countries can harness all this progress and put it to use to strengthen climate ambition at the national level. This is the task before us. As government representatives and leaders, we are expected to search for ways within our means and resources to strengthen our NDCs resolutely upward by 2020. The Talanoa Dialogue at COP24 at the end of the year is, is an important milestone on this path and Fiji fully expect that it will provide the catalyst needed to help us get there. But do not think that small island countries like Fiji is asking the world to do what we are not willing to do ourselves. While we have contributed very little to the warming of the planet and which is threatening us, we are determined to lead by example. My Prime Minister last month committed Fiji to delivering an enhanced NDC by engaging all sectors of the economy to prepare a long-term decarbonization strategy for net zero emissions by 2050 which will, will, will be launched at the COP24 in Poland at the end of the year. This process of broad consultation will inform the preparation of our new NDC, including examining strengthened reduction targets from our transport, maritime, agriculture, and forestry sectors. This, of course, is in addition to our existing commitment to produce 100% of our energy from renewable sources by 2030. As other small island developing states leaders, like the president of the Marshall Islands, which launched its own 2050 net zero strategy last month, President Hine has said, and I quote, if we, the small island developing states, can do it, so can you, unquote. And this is the challenge that they pose to other developed economies. Frankly, there is no ac acceptable excuse not to. It is the only way we can keep warming to within 1.5 degrees this century. I said at the outset that I feared that too many people continue to underestimate the challenge ahead of us. But let us not also underestimate our collective ability to solve the problem. Exponential technological change is already happening, which can be a game changer. And this we have learned from the Talanoa Dialogue, like the uh, Global Climate Action Summit, that governments need to catch up with the private sectors and regional and provincial governments and community activists who are proactive already in doing the needful on the ground. We recognize as governments that we have the ability to change our energy systems, to draw down carbon in our forests, mangroves, and soils, and to make more efficient use of our natural resources. But in the end, it's up to us to make sure we don't fall short of our potential. I thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, I, I must say that those there are so many things there that you said that I think are really important for all of us to follow up on. Obviously, the IPCC, the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report, is extremely sobering, and I encourage 
everyone to really look at that to better understand the kinds of situation that we truly are all confronting together. At this time, I'd like to turn over to um, uh, our partners uh, to the Business Council for Sustainable uh, uh, Energy, um, to Lisa, who will uh, chair our uh, panel of business members. So. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lisa Jacobson. I'm the president of the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, and I'm very pleased to be moderating a panel of a very broad set of the subnational actors that participated in the Global Climate Action Summit. So we've got city, state, uh, business, investor interests here, and they're going to give us a view from the ground up. And now that it's been a few weeks since the conference, it's a good time to be checking in with them. Um, and then, obviously, you know, so it was already mentioned the last week with um, the storms that we've experienced just in the last few days, still reeling from Florence, and then the IPCC report coming out. There's still a lot of introspection that we need to, to, to do, and we're really glad that you're here to participate with us as we're evaluating it and trying to figure out how we can really seize on um, the important challenges ahead of us. So the Business Council for Sustainable Energy has been a participant uh, from industry as well as the policy side for almost 30 years. But we are certainly, um, you know, haven't been doing it and don't have as much expertise perhaps as others. But we can give a, at least a midpoint view on this conversation. And from my standpoint, um, the findings of the IPCC report were really staggering and probably the strongest message that I've seen about the urgency of action. And so now, uh, as part of the industry coalition that I work with, which represents global companies, but mostly focused on US and North American markets, the energy efficiency, natural gas, and renewable energy industries, you know, how are we going to really accelerate even more quickly than we thought we might have had to? So with that, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the panel that we have. Um, and I'm so pleased that the ambassador and uh, Dan Carroll could be with us today, and I think they'll participate in the Q&A portion, if that's correct. So um, next to the ambassador, we have Elizabeth Beardsley, who is the Senior Policy Counsel at the U.S. Green Building Council. Next to her is Ann Kelly, uh, Senior Policy Director, Senior Director for Policy in the Bicep Network for Series. Next to her, we have Jack Theroff, uh, the Senior Vice President and Head of Regulatory Affairs for um, Enel Green Power and with a North American focus. And then Tommy down, down there, Ben is not here yet. I don't see Ben sitting next to you, but we'll introduce, we are expecting very soon, I think he was at a meeting in Annapolis, so um, Ben Grumbles, who's the Secretary of Maryland's Department of Environment. Um, but at the end, we have Tommy Wells, Director of the Department of Energy and Environment for DC. So again, a really good um, showing of the subnational actors that participated in the Global Climate Action Summit. So we actually are, are in very good time, and we want to make sure that we have at least 20 minutes for discussion. And so just get ready with your questions, because we have an excellent panel here, and uh, they can provide a lot of insight to us. But what I've been asked to do as moderator is ask each of our panelists kind of a very broad question. How did they engage and why did they engage in the Global Climate Action Summit? So I'm going to start, I guess, with Liz um, and then move our way down. But before I do, I, I want to acknowledge, you know, the Business Council had a delegation. We did, uh, you know, a lot of work in the lead up to the Global Climate Action Summit and had excellent participation in our activities and with our members. But it wouldn't have happened without Laura Tierney, who's our Director of International Programs, who's sitting in the front. And she also was instrumental in putting this panel together. So in addition to EESI, I want to thank Laura for all her work to make this happen. So with that, I'm going to turn it to Liz Beardsley. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, first of all, it was a great week, a very full week that exceeded expectations. So I want to congratulate Dan and the governor for a successful event. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just to speak a little bit about, um, you know, there was a lot going on, but my biggest takeaway was the focus on the how. So I've been to lots of climate events in the past where there's a lot of aspiration 
and maybe sometimes a little fuzziness around the edge, but I felt like this time it really delivered, um, despite a plethora of new commitments, which are very exciting, there was a lot more how, and people were getting into the weeds of policy, of how to bring the private sector, finance, and government together in new ways, um, and I thought that was all very hopeful. Um, and so to highlight a couple things, ways that we engaged, um, one was with C40 and some of the leaders like DC, who's um, stepping up with both commitments and action. Um, we're especially excited about net zero carbon buildings commitment. Um, and also we held a session with cities uh, ranging from Cincinnati, Oakland, Anchorage, and other cities um, across California and the globe. These are really the doers. So some of the staff that are taking those mayoral commitments and figuring out, okay, how are we going to work towards electrification? How do we coordinate with the grid? Um, how are we kind of making this so that it's feasible and we can still have a strong economy that's equitable? So I think those are really the, my biggest takeaways. And I think we get, clearly have much, much more to do, but I feel like we're finally getting to the important conversations of how we're gonna make this happen together. Thank you, Liz. Anne? Yeah, thank you, Liz. And um, I appreciate being here, and thanks for putting this together. There's so much to say. My challenge is gonna to be to be as succinct as I possibly can. Um, my hat's off to you, Dan, and the governor's office for what you did, and appreciate your remarks, Ambassador Solomara. Um, our responsibility is great, and uh, the burden is hitting you and, and none of the responsibility. So thanks for reminding us of that. I was pleased that the summit also did what summits often don't do, which was to be highly inclusive of individuals from other parts of the world uh, with different points of view and featuring many of the individuals that, as the ambassador noted, had no responsibility for this problem and are bearing the burden. And we could say that a hundred times and it wouldn't be enough. We have to keep reminding ourselves of, of that. There were protests. I thought it was really important that um, my colleague from Anna Pavlova, who couldn't be here today, um, from Russia said that it was so heartening to see those protests because she grew up in a place where it would have been much more difficult to challenge uh, the status quo in the government in the way that those protesters were. Whether we believe in what they were saying or not, there was energy and there was a, tr a liveliness to the summit that was welcoming, that clearly energized our base. I think the intangible um, was just how motivated one could feel being there. It was a little bit like being at a COP, at a conference of the parties, but it was right here at home in California. And there was a can-do spirit that I think was uh, pretty palpable. Um, and I agree that Al Gore completely hit it out of the park, but so did many others. I was primarily there with uh, We Are Still In. Perhaps you can see my button here. I usually wear one on the right and the left, but I only had one today. Uh, and We Are Still In, of course, was a meme that became a movement in June of 2019, now has 3,500 signatories, cities, towns, universities, colleges, tribes, businesses, investors, faith groups, most recently musicians, artists are still in. So we're building new pillars all the time in a growing consensus, uh, one which we increasingly are attempting to make bipartisan. Uh, we delivered Mayor uh, Brainerd from Carmel, Indiana. The Republican mayor stood with the We Are Still In Leaders Circle on the main stage to once again just pledge uh, that we are still in. And thank you, Dan Carroll, for reminding us that in 2020, we'll be back in. So then we're gonna change the buttons uh, accordingly. <laughs> We did an event, a full day forum, we are still in celebrating all the sectors that I just mentioned and just a couple of highlights in addition to my colleague Anna Pavlova who was very moving from Schneider Electric. Schneider Electric, by the way, is one of the enablers that is really gonna get this done. Thank you, Liz, for mentioning the how. The other enabler that's gonna get this done is on my left here, Enel, I can't wait to hear from Jack. A disruptor, so these are the kind of people we need that are disrupting our vision of what an energy system is supposed to look like, getting rid of the monopoly, working toward distributed energy, you all know that. But the summit was infused with the kind of disruption that we're gonna need urgently, and I really compliment the planners for that. It was all about the new paradigms. Our event was featuring the various practical ways in which people are still in, what does still in mean? Highlighting their commitments, highlighting um, their reach goals, their stretch goals, and doing so in a celebratory way. I wanna just highlight Fawn Sharp, who is the president of the Quinault Nation in Washington, and she gave an incredibly impassioned plea to pass Initiative 1631, the carbon pricing initiative that you all know about, um, which is of vital importance. 
Many companies uh, announced new science-based targets. There was a goal to have 500. We got to 488. As most of you know, and Dan highlighted, there are lots of good news on the, uh, on the corporate front. But, but we are still in focused on nurturing the partnerships between the various groups that I just mentioned. And we did that in an all-day uh, event and then moved on to the summit for the next couple of days. And I'll leave it at that. Well, thank you very much. Um, I want to highlight uh, and echo a few comments we've heard already. One is the focus on the how. Um, that was one of our takeaways um, from the week in San Francisco. Uh, we came to the Global Climate Action Summit kind of wearing two hats. One is as one of the largest U.S. renewable energy uh, developers and owners. Uh, so we have uh, more than 100 power plants in the U.S. and Canada, all renewable, uh, about four and a half gigawatts online today. should be over five gigawatts by the end of the year. Uh, we're also part of one of the world's largest electric utilities uh, that's based in Rome, Italy. Uh, so our parent company, operates electric utilities uh, in Europe and Latin America um, and has seen, I think smartly, but from a biased perspective, um, that the business model is changing, that we are past the moment uh, where traditional approaches are going to work. And so we are all in in investing in renewables. Uh, we're all in in facilitating electric vehicle infrastructure. And there's a moral component to that. Uh, there's a need uh, to protect our environment, to look out for future generations. There's also a profit motive. Uh, and I think one of the key elements that also came from uh, the week in, in San Francisco is that businesses are committed here. They're committed, again, for moral reasons. They're also committed because it can work for their bottom line. Uh, and that's something that, exactly, we want to help facilitate and we want to help lead on as we ourselves uh, move away from uh, our fossil units and move towards renewables. Uh, and that was one of the elements that we've certainly seen from Paris to today we, we have commitments, and I remember um, from our high school football summer weightlifting shirts that said, uh, don't tell me, show me. Um, and it's always good to see uh, and hear the commitments uh, from companies, but actually seeing them line up, uh, procure renewable energy, uh, procure it in ways that are increasingly uh, more stringent, more complicated, uh, and creating uh, from the period from 2015 to today, we're selling here in the U.S. increasingly to corporates, to Anheuser-Busch, to Kohler, to Google, to Facebook. Um, and what we are focused on is keeping up the drumbeat of ambition, of the need to continue moving forward uh, with renewables, with uh, cleaner ways of uh, producing and using energy, but also focusing on the how, um, making sure that we're, we're focused on the details that let uh, non-utility offtake take place, uh, that let uh, us build a 21st century uh, transmission system so we can get renewables uh, from parts of the country where there's a very strong resource to the population centers, uh, focusing on uh, using all of this ambition, using this energy, using this sense of urgency, uh, and focusing it on, on policy solutions that can help us uh, really get results. And so it was a very heartening week. I was also, um, we have a long way to go. Uh, so in a way, uh, very sobering, uh, but we are excited that we have a chance to remake the policy framework uh, and really change uh, businesses' approach to, again, how we produce and how we use electricity. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. The, when I think about back on that week, the, um, the first thing I think about is I wish all of you could have been there. It's... Um, there's nothing heavier than what we're all trying to do together is contemplating the planet's ability to sustain us. And with the, the storms that were happening while we were there, Hurricane Florence and a, and a um, typhoon out on the other part of the world, and as what we see right now, that it can be really heavy. I mean, we're all trying to save the planet, and it can get depressing. And as there's an accelerating um, impact that's being predicted actually happening around us, it can get depressing. So we spent a week where it was like a rally. It was a rally with uh, the major players that um, can make the difference. Um, not only did we have uh, you know, rallies from like Al Gore, but with uh, Mayor Bloomberg listing all the commitments and the progress that we're making, it really gave me a sense of that this is possible, that we can make a difference, and then ending it with um, John Mayer serenading Jane Goodall was probably one of the most <laughs> profound things 
I have seen in my lifetime, and it was special. It was special. But Washington, D.C. is a, a member of C40. C40 is now the 90 largest cities in the world, and cities are acting, making commitments together, driven um, by Bloomberg and, and other actors that about 50% of the world's population, as you know, live in cities. 70% of all greenhouse gases are due to the activity of cities. And when we talk about industrialization, it really produced cities. And so in America, 63% of our population lives in cities. And within about 20 years, 25 years, 70 plus will live in cities. And that only represents 3.5% of our, all, all of our land mass, but it's cities that are, um, that are causing this. Anytime you fly in or over cities um, at night, you know, from an airplane, you look down and you see the glows. So much of that is the cause of greenhouse gases, and that's um, where it's happening. So Washington, D.C. is um, trying to keep up and lead. We, we recognize that we have a very special relationship, Washington being that we, we house the nation's capital. That after the last um, presidential election, our mayor went to Mexico City and led a delegation of other mayors from America and said to the rest of the world of mayors that we're still in and that one election doesn't change the values and commitments of our country. And I was very proud of our mayor, and, but it recognized that the city leadership, I mean, obviously the states are important, but you have examples that you know of where a governor can deny climate change, but the mayor that's up against the, the, um, the coast has to respond and figure out how to keep their residents safe from rising waters. So the city, the mayor has um, made the pledge that we will be carbon neutral as a city by 2050, that all new buildings by 2030 will be carbon neutral, and that we will have, will divert 70% of our waste by um, 2030, 2032, and to get to 100% by 2050 at least. But these pledges are having to accelerate and as we make these pledges, we are constantly trying to figure out, well, how are we going to do that? And so I really do believe that the, the week in San Francisco um, continues to support putting us with our private um, partners and with, with other jurisdictions that are trying to figure this all out. We, you know, it is the proverbial repairing the airplane while you're flying it. And that's what we're doing. And so in other, you know, through C40 and through through these um, relationships, um, next week I'm taking a delegation of developers, contractors, and financiers uh, from D.C. to Copenhagen to meet with their counterparts there to talk about district energy and then to Brussels to talk about passive house standards. That's the kind of partnerships that we're creating through C40 and through these gatherings to learn best practices from each other as fast as we can and then convincing the, um, the folks that have, you know, that pay the money to build the buildings and do this, convincing them that it's possible that we can do it. So that's um, my takeaway was that it was a great rally. I wish every one of you could have been there. And um, it did lift my spirits that we can do this. Well, thank you. The excellent opening. Yes, please. <laughs> opening comments. I, I do not see Secretary Grumbles here yet, but um, if he does arrive, we will, of course, give him the microphone. Uh, but I, you know, a lot of emphasis on the how. And I think one comment I would make, you know, which also will relate to my question for all of you, is the role of policy in the how. But when I think back on, you know, 2015 and the Paris Agreement and the road to Paris, whether we've had political change or not, we would need to do all the things that you're talking about at the pace that we now need to do them. So, on one hand, you know, we've had some, you know, changes in our federal policy landscape, but it doesn't make um, what you're doing any less important or any less urgent. And so if our positions on the Paris Agreement were to change over time, it won't change what you're doing and the impact of what you're doing. And now the, the question is, as you said, how do we get to the how and get to the how faster? So what is the role of policy in the how? And, and obviously we're here in Washington and we're talking probably to, to many congressional staffers or others that engage in federal policy, but you don't need to limit it to federal policy, but it, you could speak to how policy 
um, can help contribute to getting the job done and getting a job done faster and more cost effectively, I'd appreciate it. And I'm going to let the entire panel comment. Dan, you're right next to me. So please take a moment and we'll go all the way down. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Well, I'm going to give a commercial for, uh, call it innovative federalism. So we, it's really hard with complicated systems, whether it's healthcare or energy or infrastructure or anything, to come up with sort of one size fits all solution. So I, I'm a big believer in there's a handshake, and I think it's very bipartisan around flexibility and accountability. So there's declining federal dollars flowing to states and declining state dollars flowing to, to locals. And so whether you want to look at energy innovation, resilience, uh, community-based health care, go across the, the board, the reality is there are local state partnerships and models that are out there, but in most cases, the challenge that North Carolina faces in terms of dams and levees and floods versus urban energy efficiency versus wildfire, et cetera, there are different challenges and there's only so much money. So I think the idea of, and we've seen some examples of it, I won't burden you with that, but I think there's an opportunity rather than trying to pass a national climate bill or climate pricing bill in any Congress I could imagine in the next several years, just given the margins, there is a ton of opportunity to be able to say, hey cities, hey states, we're gonna give you performance-based money, you tackle the problem that you want, we'll link it to performance and we'll learn and scale from there. So innovative federalism meets climate outcomes, maybe not messaged around climate, maybe messaged more around uh, other stuff, I think has a, a lot of uh, there there. Thank you, Ambassador, please. Yes, I, I believe the, the short answer would be from the national level and when you're engaging with uh, political leaders, is how to convince them that the cost of uh, inaction is way more than the political cost uh, to their own uh, career or to the, you mean the, the success of their governments uh, in power. Because as we, as we had already highlighted that, we are going to experience this devastating impact of climate change in our lifetime. We are not talking about the next generation. Uh, and and that is, in my opinion, uh, the, the challenge before us in engaging our political leaders is how do we uh, engage them to realize that it'll cost more to them and to the country if we uh, delay action on this issue. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Lisa. Um, I think looking at the, the federal role, and thanks to all of you for being here, um, I would say two main buckets. So first of all, it's really important that um, the federal apparatus continue and expand the core programs that help enable private sector and subnationals in uh, pursuing programs that address um, climate and try to mitigate more significantly what's, what's going on. So these are the range work by uh, Department of Energy, EPA, the national labs, EIA, some basic data that we need to uh, build programs off of and to um, enable some of the interesting activity, um, Energy Star, um, data access, and support for building codes. Like these are, um, might sound kind of nerdy, but they really do provide a basis for a lot of other things that are happening. Um, and then um, secondly, to really use the spending power to its maximum potential here. So to accelerate activity, whether that's um, with grids, trying to prod some of the states that haven't maybe taken some basic um, policy steps. There's states without energy codes, for example. Um, and uh, really any public funding of infrastructure or construction should have some minimum performance requirements. So these are some of the tangible steps that I think the federal uh, government can do and, and should do. Thanks, Liz. I'm reminded of former Secretary of State John Kerry who said that law is usually the latecomer. It's, it's the latecomer because it's a product of consensus that's already there and it just takes a while for it to get in place. And I feel like in this area, 
there's just a vast consensus about what we need to do if you look at any of the data from Yale and the climate communications folks. So what I often hear from highly regulated industries and incumbent industries that have benefited so far from the status quo is, you know, we don't really need rules and regulations. We can do this voluntarily. We can actually do this, you know, we can do the right thing because we really want to tackle this problem. Experience would suggest otherwise. You know, we've now had 50 years of data of our environmental law infrastructure that's been effective because it's been in rules and regulations. Without the Clean Air Act in 1970, strengthened by the 1990 amendments and all of the implications and all the regulations and permits and limits and the necessary constraint that a law can provide, which then spurs innovation. So constraint spurs innovation, and a law can play that role. Without that, we wouldn't have the clean air that we have today. So there's, in this particular area, there's plenty of data that we need good rules, but we also need rules that encourage free markets and competition. Right now, there are rules in place that are creating monopolies, as you all know. We need a diversified energy grid, a smart, modernized grid. We need energy choice, and on that, our colleagues uh, with the Conservative Clean Energy Network are in robust agreement at the state level, at, just because we're at the federal level, and it's been a tough couple of weeks um, in Washington. My heart goes out to all of you and all of us. Won't kid you. And this administration has been one of profound challenge. There's a lot of innovation in the states, and Justice Brandeis said for a reason, you know, that the states were laboratories of innovation. And I agree with Dan, a big climate bill is probably a long ways off, but there are good things happening um, at the state level, and I wouldn't ignore those. Thank you. And um, Secretary Grumbles, welcome. You are here with us. We are just wrapping up a question, and I think what we'll do is we'll let Jack and Tommy comment on that, and we'll move right to you. We were asking them we've, in the the remarks that everybody made about the Global Climate Action Summit, there was an emphasis on how practical and focusing on how to get the, how to get the job done. And so they were just commenting a little bit on the role of policy as it relates to that um, opportunity. So Jack, we'll go to you, and then Tommy, and then we'll give the floor to Secretary Grumbles. Thanks, Lisa. I'd reiterate um, the point of there being a very diverse collection of policies at the state level um, and what can work for decarbonization or for modernizing um, electricity infrastructure in one place can be totally different from another. And I think if you look at the, the wind and solar industries, um, where they've grown in the US, where they've been deployed, isn't necessarily places that have uh, a high price on CO2. And so there are many ways to come at, um, build out of clean energy. Um, for us, there's no silver bullet. It would be great if we could suggest what the policy would be everywhere. That's obviously not the case. Um, and at the federal level, we think there are um, some things that are not going to completely transform the world and you know, we, they can be passed and everyone can go home and say we, we solved our, our energy and environmental challenges, but they can make an incremental improvement. Um, and these are things, the encouraging uh, transmission build outs, um, promoting R&D, um, helping deploy uh, battery storage, both behind the meter and from the meter. Uh, there are elements that you know, we had thought of as uh, part of a potential infrastructure bill um, and without commenting on the likelihood of something like that coming together, uh, there are policy concepts that are ready uh, that can help deploy technologies that can help address a range of issues from resilience uh, to environmental uh, priorities um, and that we should um, focus on the big and the small. Uh, another analogy is it's hard to hit a curveball. It's easy to run hard to first. Uh, let's focus on the things that are doable um, and something that I, I think our industries can do um, and that the BCSC in particular has done a really good job with the fact book uh, that has come out every year for the past four or five years um, is just helping educate and remind people that uh, there are low carbon technologies that are extremely affordable that are the lowest price that you can get for uh, new electricity. In some cases, uh, can beat out even existing electricity um, based of where you are in the country. And that's something that I think for those of us who live it every day and who are competing against each other uh, to shave a cent here and there uh, and try to win a contract, we know. I don't think we've done a very good job of making it as clear as possible that um, uh, renewables are affordable and that that is a, a product of customer choice but also a product of technology uh, that hinges on policy but also uh, operates independently. Um, and it's certainly the case in the U.S. 
Um, it's also the case in Canada, in Mexico, in many markets where we're working. Um, and I think they can help um, with, the, with the enthusiasm or the, or the sense of uh, difficulty in moving towards um, zero carbon is that it doesn't have to be uh, a choice between economic growth um, and low cost energy and moving to re towards renewables. But increasingly, renewables are the low cost choice and um, it would probably help us to say that over and over as much as we can in as many places as we can. So first let me acknowledge that I left uh, an interesting meeting this morning that was being chaired by Ben Grumbles with seven states around the table trying to agree on how they're going to clean up the Chesapeake Bay together and it was a little unruly and I was glad to leave. <laughs> and um, so it's nice to see that you made it, Ben, and you don't look any worse for the wear. So on the role of policy, let me say that, you know, the leadership sets the goals, people agree on the goals, and then every jurisdiction has to have a plan. For D.C., it's the Clean Energy D.C. plan. That's the roadmap of how we're going to get to the goals. It's organic. It's going to continue to have to have input and change as technology changes, as prices change, as all that happens. So you have the plan, and then um, as you implement, that's when it really does come into laws and regulations. I think that Ann Kelly is exactly right, that the greatest goals we've made is when it's been required, when there's requirements. And that um, I know in D.C. our biggest um, you know, cause of greenhouse gases are buildings. Seventy-four percent of our greenhouse gases caused by our buildings. And so we've got PACE financing. We have a bunch of money going into solar that's spent locally. We have a sustainable energy utility at $20 million a year, which for the size of our city is great. And we have these other incentives. But all these carrots and, you know, power is pretty cheap. A lot of folks in D.C. just, well, well, we'll get to that. And we've been doing benchmarking of our buildings for about six years now. And for the past three years, if you don't send your scores in, you'll be fined. And so our... We've got some good data. So there's a bill in front of the council that I, I helped the council um, work on to create the stick, and that's the building energy performance standards that we start looking at. You're going to have to perform at a certain level or they will be fine. But meanwhile, we're also creating a green bank to go with all the other things to help fund this. And I'm very aware of the social equity issues. Our lowest performing buildings are affordable housing multifamily buildings. They don't have the margins to invest in re retrofitting their whole building without raising rates. So our job is um, on the policy levels that as we create the Green Bank, that, um, that they get the funding, financing, the, um, you know, the, the energy um, audits, things that they need to show that what their payback is, we give them the capital up front, but that's the partnership, but it's all built around policy. But there really is a need in terms of regulations, requirements, and laws. Thank you. So I'm glad that you could be with us. Do you want to make your comments from there, or do you want to come up to the podium to make a few comments? Whatever is most comfortable for you. So here. Yeah, please. Thank you so Thank you. much. Appreciate, you. It. Appreciate it. So uh, I'm Ben Grumbles, and I'm the Environment Secretary for Maryland, and I work for Governor Larry Hogan. And it's a real honor to be here. I'm uh, better late than never. And uh, I can't begin to tell you how uh, empowering and impressive it was for me on behalf of Governor Hogan to be part of the Global Climate Action Summit and focus on science-based, policy-driven goals and actions uh, to reduce um, greenhouse gases and to increase resiliency and preparedness. And as uh, the Environment Secretary for Maryland and as the chairman for the nine-state regional greenhouse gas initiative, I delivered a few messages while out uh, in San Francisco at the Global Climate Action Summit. And one of them is, on behalf of REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, I, I would say it is the, it was, it's the uh, greatest story rarely told over the last two years Five Republican governors, four Democratic governors in New England, Northeast, and the Mid-Atlantic, all agreeing to not only continue but to strengthen, at least through 2030, the cap-and-trade program. And Reggie is the nation's first 
mandatory cap and invest program and over the last 10 years, it just celebrated its 10th anniversary, it has generated $3 billion in revenues for the states to reinvest in energy efficiency, renewables, ratepayer relief. Uh, it has economic and public health benefits and sends a powerful message around the country and around the world that states are united in a bipartisan basis to move for cleaner and greener and healthier. Uh, the other, only other point I'd make just in the interest of time as the Environment Secretary for Maryland for Governor Larry Hogan, the importance of bicoastal, bipartisan, urgent and impactful actions between the public sector and the private sector is needed now more than ever and our state is absolutely committed to meeting our aggressive 40 by 30 goal, which was established through the commission that I chair uh, in the state, a diverse body of interest, public and private, and affirmed by the legislature and proudly signed by the governor. And we know that that's not the end of it, that we need to continue to move towards an 80% 80, 80 reduction in greenhouse gases by 2050, and we need to be taking important steps to transition and focus not just on the energy sector, but increasingly on the transportation sector. And so Maryland, two things that Maryland is proudly doing and that I focused on at the Global Climate Action Summit was one, working with agriculture on our Healthy Soils Initiative. Very important effort to, re to increase productivity and resiliency while reducing greenhouse gases in the, in the agricultural sector. And the other one is the first of its kind state-supported Climate Leadership Academy, which our state is launching right now, providing instruction, technical assistance to local governments, to nonprofits, to the private sector on various aspects of how to reduce greenhouse gases, how to increase efficiency in the building sector, in local government, how to increase resiliency, and not just against sea level rise, but urban heat island effect. Tommy Wells is a great leader throughout the region and the country on reducing that urban heat island effect through green infrastructure and creative regulation. So incentives and pricing, as well as regulations, can help drive policy. And I'm just glad to be catching the tail end of this important discussion on what was a very impactful and um, enthusiastic summit. Thanks. Thank you. So we have a good 15 minutes for questions. I'm thrilled about that. So um, yes, and, it, and I will ask, you know, everyone, please keep your questions very brief and keep it to a question. And please introduce yourself. Um, so this gentleman here and then this young woman right there. I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of Emerald Planet, Emerald Planet TV. It's great being here, and thank you for all the speakers. Tommy, good to see you as always. Uh, but uh, we're seeing how a lot of this activity and action is coming from the local areas, counties, cities, states, even regional bodies, as the secretary was talking about right now. So going across the, the whole group, and including our honorable ambassador from Fiji, which is one of my favorite countries, is uh, how do we uh, leverage that and let people know that? Because uh, we're international with our uh, Emerald Planet TV and we keep getting asked what's happening in Washington, what's happening in Washington. I see you have to look at the United States and the local governments to know what's really going on. So how do we get that message out there that a lot is going on and many good things? And we'll thank you for being here. Ambassador, if you'd like to start, any questions or any reactions on how we can get the message out? Uh, thank you for the, the question. I understand it's, uh, it's often a huge challenge trying to get the good message out in this environment of so many um, discouraging uh, uh, news. Uh, but I suppose, you know, like it's the, the responsibility is on all parties, you know, like governments, the private sector, even at the community levels. Uh, when we, before we came to the summit in, um, in California, uh, the Fiji delegation um, went to the state parties conference in, uh, in Bangkok. 
and there there was a lot of concern uh, that uh, governments might not meet the goals of the COP23, and that is the finalization of the rule book uh, at uh, the COP24 in Poland. But then we came to California, and we were really encouraged by the uh, enthusiasm and the, the developments, the positive developments that are happening uh, on the ground. And there was also agreement that these positive developments that are happening all over the world needs to be told and retold and brought to international conferences. And uh, it was um, in that light that uh, all the the leaders, particularly from the small island developing states and those from the Pacific Island region, when they took the floor at the United uh, Nations General Assembly this past uh, September, they highlighted the, the encouraging news that was coming out of uh, California and the need for governments to listen to, to the private sector and other stakeholders and uh, also to realize that, you know, like there's a huge movement that's happening uh, at the national and community level that political need leaders need to pay attention to. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take maybe one or two more comments on that. And we'll go to the next question. Anyone else? So I've got Dan and Anne. I just, I love your question because you're a TV guy, right? You run a TV, yeah, so you need visuals. And I'd love to deliver you several. You're, I think you're asking the right question. I mean, what Ben described is of vital importance in terms of Reggie. But I honestly would have a hard time getting you a good visual of a, of a mandatory cap and trade system that generated $3 billion for the states. Um, it's much, I think, more compelling for a visual would be the fact that the coal museum in Kentucky was covered with solar panels. You know that. that that's a game-changing kind of move. The Falcon Stadium in Atlanta is also covered with solar panels and not always known. And the Green Sports Alliance would be happy to tell you about that. I think those images where you know, wind farms actually are lovely tourist attractions that make a beautiful noise, and they're not a bad thing. And there are many, many visuals of great wind farms that have really helped farmers who otherwise, you know, were not producing in a profitable way. Um, I love the idea of talking about healthy soils as well, which Ben brought up, and getting some great visuals on what healthy soils mean. That's a real bipartisan, there's real bipartisan agreement on healthy soils, not regenerative agriculture. That's too complicated a word, but it's all about healthy soils. So I'd love to give you a list of visuals. And finally, I had a meeting this morning with a particular electric car company. I'm introducing them to NASCAR. And once we get some EVs on NASCAR, because those are the real race cars of the day, obviously, that, that's another good visual. The other thing, I'd, I mean, making a lot of little things seem big is exactly right. Uh, you got to believe, as I was talking before, it's a strategy that you just need to believe in. I think storytelling and, and visuals are key. I'll throw out one other thing I think is important is getting, whether it's state legislators or city council members or federal members of Congress, to realize that their power of convening and coming out to their district and highlighting success stories, even if they didn't create them, is just as important in many cases a metric as co writing the bill that doesn't become a law. And the, they are so welcome in their district. So, I think getting, getting members, uh, legislators, to see a, a, a different red metric for their role to support this is key. Well, I'm just going to highlight another aspect of it. We didn't really talk about the, I mean, Anne alluded to some of the economic benefits of the transformation to low and zero carbon economies. We now have over 2.3 million jobs in the United States that are supported by energy efficiency, renewable energy, and other clean energy sources. And we have case studies and, and profiles of individuals and of communities that have benefited from it. And there are many different places you can go, but I will, I'll highlight one uh, through a partner organization of the Business Council for Sustainable Energy. Uh, the Clean Energy Business Network, they've done profiles on clean energy workers called Faces of the Facts, which stems from the, the fact book, the Sustainable Energy in America fact book that the organization produces each year. So, I mean, that's just one. I mean, there are many organizations that are profiling jobs and economic benefits. So in addition to all the things that we have to do because of the negative impacts, there are a lot of economic opportunity and upsides from this. And we can give very clear and real people to, to translate that to the public and to politicians who also like to talk about economic opportunity and jobs in their jurisdictions. So we had another question. 
Thank you so much for everyone being here. Your insights from the Paris Summit are incredibly insightful. I'm Rachel Miner from the Senate. I have a question regarding the how and also changing the consensus of nuclear energy. Right now, the DOD is kind of leading the nuclear front, both for climate change and for security. But unfortunately, nuclear energy is associated with spills, leakage, problems, and also terrorism. How can we change that consensus, and what solutions did you see from the Paris climate? I can give a perspective on nuclear. It's not going to directly answer your question. Um, for us, in our investment decisions uh, in the US and globally, the concerns you've raised about the perception of nuclear to the side, um, one thing that we, and this, maybe this is helpful, just perspective of how a private company comes at it. Um, all the products that we're doing in the world, we want to try to have a three-year turnaround on. Because one thing that we don't control and that we're seeing is increasing is unpredictability in the world, in commodity markets. Um, and so one of the great things about renewable energy, instead of doing one two gigawatt project, we're doing 20 100 megawatt projects. And if there's an issue with one, you're able to adapt to another. Um, and also, if you have a turnaround from investment, start of construction to operations that you're measuring in months and not a decade or more, you know what the world's going to look like. You know, it's very difficult to predict what electricity prices are going to be, what electricity demand is going to be in 10 years out. Um, and that's part of the reason when we look at nuclear, it's, it's a challenge for those reasons. So um, from the broader climate perspective, I think you, you're absolutely right that nuclear has a role to play. That's the view um, for us here that I think is not um, more kind of commercially focused as opposed to the broader perception, I agree, is uh, very much in the media. I don't know if that's a, that may be a frustrating and, and, answer, but hopefully helpful. And, and I have to say, you know, from going from um, COP21 to today, I am completely convinced we cannot do this without nuclear power. And we have an aging power fleet. We don't know whether to mothball it or um, phase them out or not. As a, tr as a transition power, at least for the eastern seaboard in the um, northern mid-Atlantic, that um, we cannot go carbon free as fast as we want to without a transition power of nuclear. It's just a fact. And so I have been vocal on this. Um, from my generation, there's a lot of bad connotations around nuclear. I helped negotiate the Exelon PEPCO deal, and the main opposition in DC was nuclear. But the fact is, DC gets about 30% of its power from nuclear. If we bring on renewables as fast as we can, but let the, and then denuclear rise or whatever the, you know, unnuke at the same time, that we're going to go to gas and, and coal. It's just a fact. We cannot have a transition. This is true in every developed country and developing country, but mostly the developed countries throughout Europe. Germany's finding this. Um, the other countries are finding this. We can't do it without nuclear, especially we just don't have enough hydropower. We don't have enough um, you know, windmills in the, in the, on the coast out yet. Maybe we will in 15 or 20 years, but we don't have 15 to 20 years, and so it's going to cost more to keep nuclear going, and it's going to, um, we're going to have to look at how to do it. We're going to need um, policies to support it, but we cannot decarbonize without nuclear. Oh, oh, go, go ahead. Okay, I, I just uh, wanted to add that um, in Maryland, a very important component of our energy portfolio is Calvert Cliff's nuclear power plant. And I think, and, and for other states that are part of REGI and other states around the country, the nuclear component is such a critical part of clean air, and, but nobody should diminish or downplay the risks that are associated with nuclear. But I think the discussion about clean energy or clean electricity standards is a really important one that we all need to be having over the coming year or two. And, and just to say to Anne, who made the comment about the lack of visuals for Reggie, you <laughs> obviously have not met our charismatic megafauna <laughs> mascot. <laughs> <laughs> one, one last thing on nuclear, and I'll say that I'm speaking personally here. Uh, obviously, much broader topic could make, a, make for its own panel. But in, in terms of building Jack's point about practical deployment times, let me add sort of practical politics. It, it, the smaller advanced nuclear reactors, you know, if you want to move the politics on it, 
you know, there's something called the 1952 Price-Anderson Act, which puts essentially the taxpayers on the hook for the cost of accidents. So if the industry believes in its technology that much, I think their opening bid would be, we don't need Price-Anderson support. Okay, we're, we, now we got a lot of questions. So um, <laughs> we only have five minutes. So I think I'm gonna do very rapid fire, just give your questions and we'll see how many answers we can get. So one, two, and three. Just very quick, introduce yourself and ask your question and then I'll go to the panel once all three are asked. Thanks. Hi everyone, Patrick from the uh, House of Representatives. Um, with the current trend of uh, social, sorry, supply chain sustainability and uh, looking at B2B sourcing in the private sector, I was wondering if the public sector entities could comment on how you guys are tackling supply chain sustainability or if you are at all or just your general view on that. Hi, my name is Danny Hupp. I'm also with the House of Representatives. Um, I have a little bit of a thought experiment rather than a question. So, um, so while the federal government doesn't do anything on climate change, you mentioned that subnational, state, and local governments are doing things. Some are doing a lot, like California. Some are doing nothing. And so, on the one hand, that's a great thing for someone, you know, particularly in this administration. You know, the, the state and the local are acting. But on the other hand, um, I kind of worry or wonder whether that poses a unique policy problem for federal policymakers when we ultimately get to the point where we're making federal policy because there are some states that are going to be want that are going to want to be rewarded for how much they've done some states that um, will want it to be measured based on how much they emit some states that um, don't want to move at all and so I wonder if um, you think that this tapestry of state and local policies, you know, some good, some not so good, is going to pose as a challenge when we ultimately do create federal legislation. Excellent question. In the back, very quickly, your question. Thanks, hi, I'm Rachel Carrillo. I'm a writer and a climate activist um, and a, a member with the United Nations Association. Um, out of Colorado, and my, my question is for everyone, but it's mostly directed to the to His Excellency, the Ambassador from Fiji. Um, we have 68 and a half million people who are currently displaced in the world. 17 million or and rising are clim are, are refugees, and among them, climate refugees from uh, Syria uh, internally and domestically. Now we've got people from. Uh, Florence and Hurricane Harvey and now Hurricane Michael who've been displaced. So my question is how, how can we learn from small island uh, developing states like Fiji how to respond and be prepared as Americans to climate displacement which is ongoing current day and I, I recognize that um, the island nation of Kiribati has a uh, partnership with uh, the island of Fiji and, and if something happens with their island and then moving people to your islands. Thank you. Well, maybe we'll start with that, Ambassador. And then we had the supply chain question at the, at the public level. And then we had the question about how to develop federal policy given the patchwork of state and local policies. Well, thank you for the question uh, because uh, the movement of people, the displacement of people due to climate change is a very real issue that we are facing in the, in the Pacific Islands. As I had mentioned in my, in my talk, we are also, you know, like um, looking deeply into the legal implication of, um, you know, like countries that go under and what will their status be. Um, but to answer directly to your question on how should we respond, in the Fijian context, our leaders, our political leaders, have, uh, have uh, viewed the displacement of uh, people due to climate change as a humanitarian issue. And uh, that is the reason why we have taken the step of offering a refuge for the people of Kiribati and the people of Tuvalu and other neighboring countries uh, to move to Fiji in the event the, their islands uh, are threatened by uh, seawater. And, you know, like uh, if they are 
if they go under, you know, like uh, when, when the sea level uh, rise. And with so much negative uh, reporting on immigration and movement of people, uh, it is such a, we understand it's such a toxic issue like for other neighboring countries, but, but for Fiji we are fortunate because we have lived with many different races for a number of years. Yes, we have our own internal issues with it, but our leaders feel that we can overlook or well address these issues uh, you know, like internally, while at the same time offering refuge for people who may need a new home. Thank you. Thank you. So um, the next question was about uh, kind of the public sector supply chain procurement type issues. Does do you want to answer that, Dan? And then we'll. I, mean, I, I would. Uh, and I'm happy to share more with you. I mean, I think the buy clean legislation and both voluntary and other procurement changes. There's a bunch of stuff around resiliency, and there's a whole field in terms of the public sector's poor asset management of the facilities, infrastructure facilities we own. So there's a performance playbook on that. And to your question, you know, I think some version of innovative federalism, you have a policy goal, you want to give base level support to locals or states to get up to speed. I think there maybe can be a performance layer for innovators to learn more. And then uh, speaking for the state of California, for things like autos, we just, we don't want to be uh, if we're succeeding on something, we just don't want to be stopped. So on supply chain, um, LA's led a, an initiative with other uh, cities that will uh, join them across the country to um, green our fleets with the EVs so that um, bargaining down the cost of, say, the Chevy Bolt, if we all buy Chevy Bolts, and hopefully the production will be better than Tesla's been, but the, um, on the supply chain, We've done this before with, um, with streetcars. We're doing it now across the country with um, trying to, um, again, have EVs in our government fleets. We certainly can. I think all of us at different levels can do better, get finer grained of how we do purchasing. We, it's, it's fits and starts, and it's not uniform through the District of Columbia. And, you know, and we're working on that. But that is certainly um, an area of growth for us. Just, uh, I would, uh, on, on the uh, state leadership, possibly making it more difficult for federal policy leadership, I, every state that I work with uh, makes it clear that as they're taking proactive steps on cl for climate, uh, that uh, there's a very important role for the federal government. And so, for instance, in Maryland, <coughs> as we take steps to reduce the carbon footprint in the transportation sector, we're also uh, pushing back really hard on rollbacks at the federal level. So it's, it's, you have to have a two-pronged message. One of, we can do this in our, our lane, our space, but we also need federal leadership. With that, I think we're going to close. I want to thank all of you. I, I want to thank our panel, and I also want to thank EESI for the excellent leadership in the series of events they do on many important energy and environmental topics. So let's give the panel a hand and also to the audience. I just very quickly wanted to say before you all leave, um, uh, to add our thanks to everyone, uh, to the ambassador, to Dan, to our whole panel. But but also, uh, the issue about jobs came up. So there, uh, outside on the table, there is a briefing notice. We're doing a briefing on October 25th, all about jobs and what's going on in the energy sector. And there will be state by state information as well. So it's another place, and it's another way to get some visuals. Okay, see, <laughs> thanks.